Good morning, Forest Grove Community Church. Great to have you join our online service today. Special welcome to guests and visitors that are joining in on our service. We're so glad that you've joined us as well. And during this time when we can't gather in person and our best way to gather is online, um, we just appreciate you continuing to make this a priority, that we still gather together as a congregation, gather together as a community, and worship together, hear God's word together. So welcome. It's, it's great to have you here. We also miss out on being able to greet each other, and I normally would say at the beginning of the service, stand up and shake some hands of people around you. Well, maybe you want to do that if you're watching with some people today, but um, yeah, um, how about we do that virtually? So if you have, have, our, our, have connection to, to our chat feature on YouTube or however you're watching, uh, yeah, just say hi to each other and connect, maybe tell people where you are. And just to kind of throw in a fun question, I don't know about you, but yesterday I went for a beautiful walk. The sun was shining. This deep freeze is finally lifted. I went down my favorite place to walk, which is down Broadway, and there was just people everywhere. So maybe just for fun on the chat, um, put on where do you like to walk or hike or bike or run in this city? Where are you looking forward to doing that as, as the weather gets warmer and as we get closer to spring? So have some fun with that connect with each other, and again, uh, welcome to our, our online service today. Well, this Sunday is the first Sunday of Lent, and Lent began this last Wednesday on what the church calendar calls Ash Wednesday, and Lent is simply the 40 days before Easter. It's kind of a preparation time for Easter when the church focuses on prayer, fasting, and generosity. Now, what does the word Lent actually mean? Take a look at this definition from Steve Bell. He says, The word Lent means spring and derives from the word long or lengthen. It refers to the lengthening of days when the sun releases the earth from her icy bondage. It represents a turning from barrenness to fruitfulness, a return to life in all its diverse fullness. So how do you feel about that? The, the earth giving up that icy bondage for spring to come. I think there's maybe been no year that we've been more excited for that to happen. And yet I know as hardened Saskatchewan people, we know we've got a lot of winter to go yet, but I hope and pray that we have hope in the coming of spring. And that whole idea of from death to life, from barrenness to fruitfulness, is what Lent is all about. It's that preparation period before Easter when we celebrate new life. Aren't you amazed every year when you look at the bleakness and the deadness around us in nature that in spring it actually comes back to life? It's amazing. That's really the picture of Lent. Now, I know in past weeks, many of you have been commenting on our beautiful plants up here and how it's getting brighter and greener, and now we have this, and you're wondering why is that there? Well, that's our picture as we begin Lent. That is, that is dead branches. You can see some buds starting. But it's about barrenness coming to fruitfulness, death coming to life. So let that be a symbol. And it's going to get greener and brighter until Easter Sunday flooded with flowers. And so we're just excited for the hope that God can bring us during the season of Lent. So bow with me in a word of prayer. Let's pray together. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we worship you. Thank you, Jesus, for this time of year when Hope can be born in us even further. Lord, for many of us, this has been a hard season. The deep freeze of winter, a continuing pandemic, more isolation, disappointing news. Lord, I know that for many, it's discouraging and even hard to get hopeful as exciting as spring sounds. So I ask, Lord Jesus, I ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you will just fill and just waft over each member of our congregation, each person who's watching today. And Lord, I pray that we won't have to muster up hope for spring, hope for the future, hope. But Lord, I pray that by the power of your spirit that you will pour out your hope and your life into each one of us. Lord, thank you that we can gather in this way. And Lord, I pray that even as we watch in, in living rooms, on our own, with others, Lord, that we will still sense your spirit as you, as you speak through songs, as you speak through your word, as you speak through Pastor Bruce, as he'll bring the message later today. And so, Lord, as we worship in song now, Lord, as we sing the song, Graves to Gardens, Graves into Gardens, Lord, that whole picture, 
May that be real in our life, Lord, that that's what you're going to do in this season in our lives. And Lord, as we sing a beautiful hymn together, may we worship you, truly worship you as God Almighty. And Lord, as we lift you up in praise, can we so boldly ask you to lift us up? So Lord, we lift you up. Please lift us up as we worship you, as we praise you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. My name is Janine, and uh, it's my pleasure to uh, lead you in worship this morning. I have joining me this morning the Tillmans, Cody and Jill. And um, I didn't just invite you in your homes today that you would just um, join us in song today as we sing of um, the goodness of God. Creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing, oh, praise Him, alleluia, thou burning sun with golden beam, thou silver
the God of the valley, and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you, there's nothing better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, there's nothing better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty. Good morning, Forest Grove. What a privilege to bring you God's word this morning. My name is Ruth Ann Durantz. I'm going to be reading from Galatians 5, 13 to 18. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out, beware of destroying one another. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives, then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. Well, I also want to say good morning to each one of you, and we are continuing in our series in the book of Matthew, and we'll be looking at Matthew chapter 5. Last week, Don uh, took the first run at this section that is between the Beatitudes in chapter 5 and uh, what is coming, which is the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. And it's this section that has some of the most pointed and difficult teaching that Jesus has in all of the Sermon on the Mount. 
And it talks about a very radical, again, kind of kingdom culture that we are called to. And as Don mentioned last week, you can think of these uh, segments here that we'll look at today as kind of antithesis statements where Jesus says, you have heard it said, but I say to you. And you can group them into uh, two different groupings of three. Uh, And Don uh, looked at the one grouping last week. He looked at uh, loving your enemies, and uh, he graciously left me with the focus today of murder, adultery, and divorce. Thank you very much. Uh, But actually, we agreed on that together, so I can't totally blame him. Um, And Don did a great job last week of introducing this section. And one of the key verses for us to understand this section is actually found in verse 17, where Jesus says, don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose, is what he says. And this is a really important piece for us to understand, uh, to understand what the implications of this are for us. Because you see, the Old Testament or the Old Covenant was for the people of Israel. And while, yes, we are grafted into their inheritance, we also have to understand that we have a new covenant. And we follow the resurrected Jesus into this new covenant that was established by him. And so while the Old Testament or the Old Covenant is equally inspired by God and equally the infallible word of God, It doesn't have equal application to us uh, in terms of our lives as New Covenant people. And so we have to be careful and understand more deeply of how we uh, apply these texts to our lives. And that's part of what Jesus is doing here in this section. As we are to understand things in terms of Old Covenant and Old Testament in the light of Jesus, in the light of the resurrection, and as New Covenant people. And so Jesus is pointing us to that. Very similar to what the author of Hebrews says, and there's a few key lines that I want to just highlight for us. For instance, Hebrews 10, verse 1, where it says, The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. Or in Hebrews 8, 6, where it says, But now Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood. For he is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with God, based on better promises. Or in 8.13, it says, when God speaks of a new covenant, it means that he has made the first one obsolete. It is now out of date and will soon disappear. The Apostle Paul, he also in his letters, uh, especially in Galatians, but in other places, he references this as well and talks about what it means to be new covenant people. And one example of that is found in 2 Corinthians 3, where he says, uh, he has, Jesus has enabled us to be ministers of his new covenant. This is a covenant not of written laws, but of the Spirit. The old written covenant ends in death, but under the new covenant, the Spirit gives life. And so, it's important for us as we go into these texts today, and as we continue to read through Matthew, that we understand that this new covenant is not of legalism or of the Mosaic laws, but it's of a new life in the Spirit. It's a new kind of righteousness. And it's a righteousness that comes from the inside out. It's about what Jesus is teaching here about what is within us is what comes out of us. And it's what allows Jesus to say things like in verse 20 of Matthew 5, where he says, but I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Or later on in verse 48, where he says, but you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And so God has greater things in store for us. If we would just embrace this kingdom culture that he is inviting us to, especially in terms of loving relationships and with people that are close to us, that we are to live by the Spirit's power in a different way. And so Jesus here isn't negating Scripture, but he is reorienting their understanding, dismantling their understanding as he sits with his disciples about what they would have understood from the law of Moses. And he's bringing it to a new level, bringing it to fulfillment. And so Jesus is giving a fuller expression of God's will for God's people. And now he gets into the heart of the issues of what Moses taught in the Old Testament of these things of murder, adultery, and divorce. And so Jesus sits down, as we know in this Sermon on the Mount, and he sits on a mountainside. He teaches his disciples, similar to Moses, but uh, he doesn't just sit alongside Moses as another teacher. He places himself above Moses as he fulfills all that Moses was teaching and was pointing to. And it's this kingdom culture that is from the inside out that is dealing with issues of the heart. 
And it's, again, it's like what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 31, where there's this prophetic word that in many ways is being fulfilled in what Jesus is teaching in Matthew. And it says this in Jeremiah, the day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. And this covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant, though I love them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant that I will make with them, the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. And I will put my instructions deep within them, and I will write them on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they will be my people. So this is what Jesus is pointing to in this section of how do you love people that are close to you? And maybe if you're a parent with young kids, you can think of it this way. Uh, You might, uh, as parents sometimes, especially if you have kids who don't always get along, which I know is often the case, and maybe you catch yourself saying things like this to your kids, and and afterwards you kind of even wonder, did that really come out of my mouth? But you're saying things like, you know, stop hitting your sister, or when is it okay to punch your brother in the mouth, or stop calling each other names, or whatever the case may be. And so sometimes uh, our parenting feels successful in some ways if those things don't happen. If our brother actually just doesn't punch a brother in the teeth or they don't light their sibling's hair on fire or they're not calling each other awful names and ending with, I hate you, uh, then we think, okay, we've succeeded in some way. And and in a way, it's kind of a sad baseline for success, isn't it? Um, But it's it's one that many of us can relate to sometimes in difficult family relationships. And maybe even you, you're, you're hoping that that could be a baseline even for your next family gathering when you can gather together. And I get it. And in some ways, that's what the law is trying to do and trying to accomplish that we see in the Old Testament with the people of Israel. As you read the Ten Commandments even, it's like, you know, don't, don't kill each other. Okay? Like, don't steal your neighbor's oxen or livestock. And, and also, don't, don't steal your neighbor's wife. It's, it's pretty low baseline for how we are to live in relationship, isn't it? And so as parents, when suddenly one of our kids does something or says something that really shows empathy or really shows love or commitment to a sibling, and, and our hearts just melt and we go, wow, like, really? Like, that's just like a whole nother level. And in a similar way, I think it's what Jesus is pointing us to here in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew is he's talking about this new kingdom. And he's saying there is so much more that is available to you if you live with the power of the Spirit. You can experience more than just not killing each other. You can actually experience great freedom. And so that's what he's unpacking here in this text. So let's just read, uh, starting in Matthew 5, verse 21, and we'll just read 21 to 24, as he speaks about this first piece about murder. He says, you have heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you're in danger of the fires of hell. So if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, you suddenly remember that someone has something against you. Leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person. And then come and offer your sacrifice to God. So Moses has been teaching, you know, not to murder each other. And Jesus goes deeper than that. Jesus goes beneath that. He gets to the heart of the issue. And he says, you know what? The heart of the issue is actually anger. And you need to deal with your anger in terms of how you relate to the people around you that are close to you and that you love. And so Jesus redefines murder by entering into the heart of the murderer and getting at the core issues of anger in our lives. And and so it leads to things that are so destructive. And so he's saying you need to deal with those things. And one of the ways you might think of this is a a comprehensive and maybe a simplistic uh, approach to this is instead of anger, he's saying the transforming ethic is reconciliation. That our kingdom culture is about pursuing a radical and continuous reconciliation. That we need to be quick to reconcile. And if you're even on your way to court with an adversary, that that you don't let it get there. That you settle your differences quickly. Even if you're in the middle of a religious ceremony and you realize that somebody's got something against you, which kind of implies that you know them fairly well, that there's a closeness and proximity and relationship. He says, leave your sacrifice there at the altar and just go and make it right 
Later on in Matthew, in, in chapter 18, Jesus turns it the other way and he says, if you realize that you actually have something against someone else and that something has occurred in your life so that you have anger and that you have resentment and you've been hurt, then, then what do you do? You go and actually make it right with that other person. And so he's always pointing this fact that you need to go first. Whether you're somebody who realizes that somebody's got something against you or you actually have something against somebody else. And so the goal of kingdom culture is that everybody is pursuing this active reconciliation at every level. Even if it means interrupting sacred services or legal judgments, whatever the case may be. And so this call to reconciliation is it's a foretaste of the kingdom. It's a way to experience this kingdom culture in ways that are beyond the baseline. And so we can look to extreme examples of hurt and reconciliation, but I think it's almost more helpful to look at the really small day-to-day things that go on in our lives with people that we're really close to because oftentimes those are the people that are the hardest to love, aren't they? Our siblings, our parents, our coworkers, our neighbors, or even our spouses. So we're called to this lifestyle of reconciliation, that it's to be pervasive and it's to be proactive in every area of our lives. And you know, reconciliation isn't just something that happens to us, it's actually something that we pursue. And so Jesus calls his disciples to check their hearts. And he says, pay attention to what's inside and take action, quick action, to pursue reconciliation before it grows into something bigger. And again, the acid test is those that are closest to us, those that we interact with every day. How do we love them? So even in husbands and wives and that kind of relationship, which is where Jesus turns next. So continuing reading in verse 27, Jesus goes on and he says, You have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. But I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. So again, Jesus is sitting in the posture of Moses, sitting on this mountainside, quoting Moses, and then going deeper than Moses. A new Torah, a new ethic of a new people of God with a new depth of understanding of the will of God when it comes to sexual purity. And you know, as you look back through the story of God in the Old Testament and all the way through the New Testament, uh, from the very origins uh, to this new covenant, you see that, that sex has two primary purposes that are articulated throughout Scripture, for procreation and for pleasure in the context of marriage between one man and one woman. But all too often, what Jesus is pointing to, there are these uncontrolled desires that can quickly lead us astray, that can cause all kinds of pain, And lead us down paths that God never intended for us. And that's why we see, even in the Old Testament, in the book of Job, where it says, the eye of the adulterer watches for dusk, and he thinks no one will see me, and he keeps his face concealed. Or in Proverbs 5, where it says, for the lips of an immoral woman are as sweet as honey, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is as bitter as poison, as dangerous as a double-edged sword. And so Jesus In our Matthew passage, he puts the onus and the responsibility clearly on the men who in that context and at that time often use the law to their advantage to make it about the guilt being placed on the woman and letting them kind of go scot-free, especially if adultery had occurred. And so Jesus lays the full responsibility in this text on the men. He says, control your desires. Now, we know that this can be a problem for both men and women, but here in this text, he's responding to a cultural norm, and he's pointing to the men, and he's saying, this is your responsibility to control your desires. And so he uses exaggeration, just like he did in the previous section, to make a point. And he says, if your eye's leading you astray, he says, gouge it out. If your hand is causing you to sin, cut it off. And he makes it clear that there are eternal consequences. And he talks about the fires of hell. He says, pay attention to this stuff. This matters. And so Jesus redefines adultery at a deeper level, just as he did with the example of murder. And as murder begins with anger, he says adultery begins with lust. 
And so it doesn't begin with the outward actions. It begins with what's going on inside. It begins with issues of the heart. And so pay attention to the issues of the heart. It matters because these things escalate. It's interesting in a, a later letter that was written by James, Jesus' brother, he actually picks up on this theme and he says it this way. James says, and, and remember when you are being tempted, do not say God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires which entice us and drag us away. And these desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So James here too is pointing to that which is going on inside of us. And that if we allow these things to be uncontained, uncontrolled, and they start to grow, and then they can eventually lead to so much pain and even death in one way or another. And this is why issues like the pervasive issues of pornography are so important for us to deal with and take care of in our lives. What we allow our eyes to look at and get inside of us. These are not just neutral or innocent sins, so to speak, that don't, don't really affect or hurt anyone else. No, they hurt a lot of people. And they hurt people who allow these things into their hearts and into their minds. And then they eventually lead to actions that can lead to death of one kind or another. And so Jesus is pointing to this truth that holiness and a deep love needs to mark this kingdom culture. This is God's intention, God's design. And so D Jesus goes deeper inside the act of murder to get to anger. He goes deeper inside the act of adultery to get to lust. And he says, pay attention. Because these can also lead to what he speaks to next, which is divorce. And he says as we continue on, he says, You have heard the law that says a man can divorce his wife by merely giving her a written notice of divorce. But I say that a man who divorces his wife, unless she has been unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. And so the underlying issues of anger and lust are two of the primary sins and contributors that can eventually lead to the brokenness of the marriage commitments and to divorce. Now, you know, understanding uh, murder and adultery and the things that lie belief beneath them is, is actually relatively easy compared to understanding and applying this text, what Jesus talks about in terms of divorce and remarriage. And this is an area in the church, and I will just confess as a pastor, this is an area in the church that, that confounds us, that is confusing, that is difficult. It's, it's likely the most complex and difficult pastoral issue that those of us in this kind of role ever face. It's as if we see through a glass dimly. And, and it's not that Jesus' teaching is unclear or God's design is unclear. It's just that sin wreaks havoc on God's design all the time. And so then we're left with this complex, a whole series of complex pastoral applications of what do we do when, when marriages fail, when sin is uh, apparent and divorce happens. And so what's important and what Jesus continually points us to in this kingdom ethic is what is God's ideal? What is it that he's calling us to? What is it that he intended for marriage? Scott McKnight uh, says it this way, that marital love is to reflect God's love for us. And just as God is with us and for us and unto us, so we too must love our spouse that way. We must be with them, present. We must be for them as an advocate. And we must be unto them. In other words, exclusive. And so Jesus summarizes here what Moses taught in the law. If you go further on in Matthew 19, further on in this gospel, he picks up this question again as people are asking him again about, well, they're looking for the loopholes. What is permissible? What is allowed? And, and so he goes back in that text to the original design in Genesis. And, and he says how Moses only permitted divorce because of the hardness of people's hearts. Women were to be given a certificate of divorce, which dissolved the marriage and then gave them freedom to remarry. But divorce in that culture had become too easy, and they'd become uh, simplistic, and the men could divorce for almost any reason. And so Jesus, again, heightens the bar, raises the bar, and he addresses this common understanding of the religious leaders and the people of that day, and he takes it to a new height. He calls them to this higher standard. And he says, you need to deal with these things that are on, on the inside of us. So that divorce is actually never on the horizon. 
And Jesus stands with the conservative, with Moses, and he even goes deeper and beyond Moses, and he, he dismisses almost any reason for dis- divorce except for the narrowest of exceptions, sexual immorality. And he's basically shutting the door on this for almost any reason. And, and it's ones that the men of that day would use all kinds of subtle things. Whatever they didn't like about their wife, they would just give them a certificate of divorce. And he's going, no, 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 no. That is not what this is about. And in fact, what Jesus also affirms here is he gives a nod to staying single and the value of singleness. Just as he does even more pointedly in Matthew chapter 19, where he affirms it even more explicitly. And so we need to see here in this kingdom culture that Jesus is bringing in, that that God is for marriage, and he is also for singleness. But if you get married, then live it out in a way that, so that divorce is never in the picture. It's never even a possibility because you're taking care of the things of the heart. And again, we so often look for the loopholes and the exceptions, and we wonder, okay, well, what's permissible? And in that, we miss the point of what Jesus is saying, that marriage is sacred, holy, and an honored union. Created to make a man and a woman one flesh, never to be violated by divorce. It's contrary to God's desire because he is a God that is with you, he is for you, and he is unto you. And so we are to live in a similar way in this pursuit of reconciliation. So even though we understand that divorce is not the will of God, and only permitted because of the hard-heartedness of humans. We, we pursue reconciliation, but we also grieve when all the efforts have failed and divorce comes for countless reasons. Because we know that we live in this kingdom of the now and the not yet. We get glimpses of it, we're called to live into it, but we know that we live in the reality of the now and the brokenness of the world. And people commit sins that destroy marriages and divorce happens. And so for us as a church, we deal with these issues of divorce and remarriage in a serious way. We deal with them on a case-by-case basis. We have guidelines that we try to follow. We have a process that involves others. We involve asking, it involves asking hard questions as we try to get to the heart of the issues. And then we make our best judgments of how to live this out in the kingdom culture of the now and the not yet. And so Jesus sets out the ideal, but we know that we live in the real. And we live in the fallenness and the brokenness of this kingdom that we long for more of. Call to righteousness, purity, and reconciliation that's possible. But we also know that we have to live in the brokenness and the mess of human relationship. Seeking God's grace and imperfect reconciliation with those that we are close to. Another thing that I just want to mention that we also take seriously and likely need to take even more seriously is spousal abuse or domestic violence of any kind. You know, that's not something that's spoken explicitly here in the text, but it's where the path leads when we don't deal with the issues that are in the text. When we don't deal with the issues of anger and lust that is uncontained, and when these aren't dealt with with repentance and accountability and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It can lead to physical, emotional, and even sexual abuse that destroy covenant relationships of marriage, but it puts people at risk and it destroys people. And these should never be tolerated in a marriage relationship. You know, the commitment to marriage and the commitment to the high ideal that God has for us doesn't simply look past these abuses and tolerate them. They are always wrong and can understandably lead to divorce. And this is why God hates divorce. And so does everybody who's in the midst of it or going through it because it means that sin is running rampant and this kingdom culture and the ideals have been abandoned. And so we seek God's grace and wisdom and courage to hold mercy and righteousness together. And it's complicated. And oh, by the grace of God, God, would you lead us in these things, we pray. And so Jesus lifts our eyes beyond Moses He lifts our eyes beyond the baseline of relationships for those that we're close to, and he wants us to get past the legalism and the loopholes and the technicalities and the asking, well, how far can we go? What is permissible? And he says, no, no, lead differently. Lead different lives. Lead in a kingdom way. Get at the core issues of the heart that give you freedom. And that's why I love that text in Galatians that that Ruth Ann read earlier in the service 
where Paul is talking about this, and it connects to the very things that Jesus is teaching here in Matthew 5. And so in Galatians 5, Paul says again, For you have been called to live by freedom, my brothers and sisters. Just listen to these words. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you're always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. And so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives, and then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. And these two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. Let's pray. So Lord Jesus, we just thank you for this powerful truth and this new ethic that you call us to. That is not life in the law, but it is life in the Spirit. And God, I just pray that you would help us to be honest and get at the deeper issues of our lives and the sins that lurk within, the anger, the lust that can lead to all kinds of destruction and death. And God, would you reveal those to us? Would you forgive us for those things? Would you help us to confess them? Would you help us to move in new directions and new freedom? And God, may we live lives of active and proactive reconciliation, that we walk towards people with grace and humility. And Lord, would we live in a different way, especially to those that are closest to us, Lord. Help us to pay attention to those that we love and just live in a different way. Help us to create a different kind of kingdom culture, even in our homes, in our workplaces, in our families. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I'm sure after Jesus spoke that sermon and at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, I wonder how many people came up to him and said, good sermon, pastor. Thank you for the message. It's a hard word. It's a deeply convicting word. And so, Bruce, I say thank you for being true to the words of Jesus and to Scripture. And yet, I think it's so important that we, that we respond to this word today. Now, as we take some time to respond, I just want to encourage you, as Bruce prayed, to say, Holy Spirit, in our brokenness, Lord Jesus, in our brokenness, I open up my heart to you. And as we consider what, what Bruce spoke, as we consider those sins that entangle us and lead to death, perhaps we need to take some time for repentance today. I know my heart and my spirit is convicted, and I ask you to join me in the very thing that we're called to, called repentance, confession of our sin, to be reminded that the Scripture tells us that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. But for, a, for the few moments here as we reflect, we need to think again of those Scriptures. Where, where is anger and hatred taking root in us? Where is lust prevalent in our lives? Where has selfishness and just wanting our own needs and desires to be fulfilled brought us to these places of brokenness and darkness? So I just want to leave a moment of, of silent prayer. And if you will join me and together, let's just respond in, in repentance to a God who loves to hear confession because he loves to forgive. So let's just take a moment to do that. Again, the Word of God tells us that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us and cleanse us. And so to hear the good news as we repent and as we confess how much your Father, how much your God, how much Jesus wants to forgive you. You know, when we reflect on all the brokenness and we can 
we can think that, wow, you know, God hates divorce and God, God hates sin. And yes, but why? Ultimately, because he hates brokenness. He grieves brokenness with us, his creation, us, his children. You know, when we sin, what do we do? We don't go to God usually. We usually feel the shame and we feel the guilt. And so what do we do? We hide from God. We push God away. And that's what breaks God's heart more than anything. He wants relationship. That's what Bruce was talking about today. That's the deeper thing that Jesus wants. He wants this open, forgiving relationship with us where we can live that out with him and with others. And so I want to encourage you to walk towards repentance and walk towards forgiveness. Often when, when we confess our sins, we're kind of left maybe a little bit uneasy about how do we, how do we move on. And so I, I, I just want to acknowledge only Jesus can forgive sins. But can I just make a declaration that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. And we can all say together, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. So receive that forgiveness and let's walk and respond in this kind of kingdom culture, aware of our brokenness, but aware of the God that wants to restore. I'm going to ask the worship team to come. They're going to lead us in a closing song. And I just encourage you to just continue to respond and to pray in your spirit as they sing. So let's close in prayer together. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you for the incredible gift of forgiveness. Thank you that when we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just, and that you forgive us and you cleanse us. And Lord, I pray that each person listening and praying with me, Lord, that we will be humble and honest and broken about our sin, but that we will also know that we can come to you and be forgiven. So, Lord Jesus, I pray that the power of your forgiveness will flood through your people today. We respond to you. We worship you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Thank you.